The only lecture of this series that is specifically related to physics in the title, although many of them are in thought, including, of course, the word quantum into tomorrow's lecture. But the one lecture that specifically mentions physics should coincide with Abdus Salam's birthday, so that I didn't even remember, although I'd been told that it was today. So I changed my mind this afternoon a little of what I would do to make it, I hope, more fun and more elementary. So I will still talk, of course, about mock modular forms and a little bit about the string theory of black holes, about which I understand absolutely nothing, but one of my co-authors is in the room and can help me out if I get stuck. But I decided to begin by pirating a kind of a popular lecture that I gave twice, once in uh, France, in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, before a big audience of mixed from researchers to uh, school students, and one uh, sort of a repeat of the same lecture in Oberwolfach a year later. And so I have put the PDF on this computer, which I usually don't use, and it will contain also the text, not in English or in Italian, but in French or German, French and German, but it doesn't matter, you're not supposed to read it. It's a completely different lecture. Simply, the pictures are nice, and they're there, and I have no idea of the technology, how to transfer pictures from one thing to another. So you'll see it, and if you read bits and pieces, you can practice your German and French if you get bored with my English. But it's also my German and French, so you'll be equally bored. So if, if you can tell me how to switch it on, and then apparently I just press a button to go up and down, and I hope it works. I'm, I'm very poor with this technology. I basically think mathematics should never be projected on the board because it goes too fast, and I already go too fast without it. So, as I say, I'm going to begin by kind of a, a, a repeat of some of the ideas of that lecture in a completely different order, especially because later in this lecture, I try to give a general idea what modular forms are. And I've been doing that now for three days, but still I can show you one or two pictures that I could have showed you on Monday if I decided to use the machine then. So the picture, as you can read in the opening sentences, if, if you can see them and if you know French or German, is about what I consider one of the rom most romantic stories in the history of mathematics. And I tell here that it's the story of a poor, unknown uh, uh, scientist from a highly, at that time, underdeveloped country, now rather developed, namely from India, who wrote a letter to a very prominent scientist in a very developed country who responded magnanimously and very, very well, which sounds good for the West, unless you know that the poor first person, who was, of course, Ramanujan, sent off several such letters, and all the other recipients threw them in the waste paper basket, and only Hardy uh, actually responded. So on the left, you see from an Indian postage stamp a picture of Ramanujan. He's quite young on that picture, but that's normal because he died when he was 33, so he was always rather young. Uh, the other picture shows Hardy when he was young, and he lived to a much riper age, although not particularly old, but that's when he was a young man smoking a pipe and looking very deep. Uh, but both of them were very deep. So the story is kind of a wonderful one, as I say, a very romantic one. So in the talk, uh, maybe it's already written on the next page, but I don't want you reading at the same time, so I'll keep it secret for a bit. Hardy, one day, out of the blue, he's in Cambridge, he gets a letter from an unknown Indian clerk, and, well, I do have to show you the letter. Uh, if I can remember, just up, no, down. Funny, if I want to go down, I go down. Okay. It's probably illegible in that size, but I can read it to you, at least you see it. Somewhere I even had a facsimile of the original, but not here. It begins, Dear Sir, I beg to introduce myself to you as a clerk in the accounts department of the Port Trust Office at Madras on a salary of only 20 pounds per annum. I am now about 23 years of age. That was completely truthful, he was 25. Uh, I have had no university education, but I have undergone the ordinary school course. And then he said, I have not trodden through the conventional regular course, which is followed in a university course, but I am striking out a new path for myself. I've made a special investigation of divergent series in general, and the results I get are termed by the local mathematicians as startling. And then follow pages and pages of, uh, I have a couple of them here, 
both in the original handwriting, which is more or less illegible, and then in, uh, is this only the handwriting version or the text version? They're both more or less illegible. So one is printed, one is handwritten. You aren't supposed to read them anyway, just to see very dense formulas. There were 100 formulas, roughly, pages and pages of formulas, and all of them looked completely wild. So Hardy looked at this thing, and in the talk I say, imagine yourself in this situation. You're a very, very well-known mathematician. You get a letter from someone you've never heard of with 100 theorems, all of which look rather crazy. So normally, you know, we all professional mathematicians get letters from cranks all the time. I've proved Hermann's last theorem. I've proved the Riemann hypothesis. And usually they go into the waste paper basket. But somehow, Hardy kept looking, and these formulas looked so strange. After a while, he called in his colleague Littlewood, the famous Hardy and Littlewood collaboration. At the back of his mind, says C.P. Snow in his famous book, at the back of his mind, getting in the way of his complete pleasure in his game, he was thinking about a cricket game, the Indian manuscript nagged away. Wild theorems, theorems such as he had never seen before, nor imagined. A fraud or genius? A question was forming in itself in his mind. And the question was, is it more likely to have a fraud who's capable of inventing such plausible looking theorems, or a genius who can just write them down? And after an entire night studying the manuscript with Littlewood, they stayed up till deep in the night studying, they decided it had to be genius. Because some of the theorems, a few of them they even recognized, they knew. A few they could prove with great difficulty. These were two of the top European mathematicians of the time. A few they couldn't prove at all, but could imagine how you'd go about it and could imagine proving. And many they couldn't imagine at all. But by that time, they were convinced that this man was something extraordinary. And as I say, they behaved very well. Hardy wrote to him, invited him to come with a scholarship to Cambridge. Then they sent, actually, a, another well-known person all the way to India to bring him. It was all very complicated. He had dietary restrictions. There were, he didn't really want to come, but they, they brought him. He got a very fancy scholarship. He became a, a fellow of this Royal Society. I mean, he was actually rather well treated in England. He hated England. Uh, all of the years he lived there, I mean, he loved working with Hardy. He hated the country, partly the food. Well, everyone hates English food, but his problem was, of course, not that, but that you couldn't get uh, food that he was allowed to eat. At the time, it was all you know, very strongly meat-oriented. And his health got bad, and he actually got very depressed. This, was, this initial letter was in 1912. Uh, wait, no, that's... I, I know these dates by heart, but suddenly I block on it. Uh, what was the date? 1913, January 1913. By the time he came to England, the war broke out, and he would have normally gone back in 1915 or 1916, but he couldn't go back till 1918, actually 1919, because of the war. And actually, in the last year of the war, he made a suicide attempt. He tried to throw himself under a streetcar and was just stopped in time by somebody. He was very, very unhappy. And when he did go back to India, he felt, felt very sick and died uh, a year, just over a year later, in 1920. So, in that first letter, he sent all of these amazing theorems. And actually, many of them, the really amazing thing from the point of view of a modern mathematician is not just that he could find them. That, of course, once you've accepted that somebody's an extraordinary genius, well, then he's an extraordinary genius. But that so many of them were based on modular forms. But he had no idea what a modular form was. He sometimes, for him, remember in each of my lectures, I've emphasized this duality between the two faces of modular forms, you have a function of a variable tau, which is in the upper half plane. And this function is equal maybe up to some other Morphy factor, but it transforms under this infinite group of symmetries. And that infinite group, actually, I can page ahead, because in this popular lecture later, I try to explain in words to a very general audience what modular forms was. And I said, if you look at these pictures, on the left, you see a parabola, which you learn in school, and that is a symmetry you know, x squared is equal to minus x squared. So you see a twofold symmetry. Then I show a picture of a cosine curve or a sine curve, and that is an infinite group of symmetries of translation by 2 pi, and also a reflection. So this is a group z, or even the semi-direct product of z with z2, is slightly non-abelian. But what I said, when you come to modular forms, you have an infinite group, and since it was a non-technical lecture, I didn't talk about SL2z and so on, but I showed, probably illegally, a picture by Escher uh, one of the famous 
Escher drawings and this of devils and angels, and they're filling up a disk, which is actually holomorphic. It's the disk, but it's holomorphic equivalent to the plane. And if you think of each angel and devil together as making a fundamental domain for some group like SL2Z, this is actually exactly a picture of the way that a modular function repeats. So that's just because I never got to show you that picture before. Now you've seen it, but I don't want to stay with it. And also in that lecture, I explained about partitions, which is one of the things that made both Hardy and Ramanujan utterly famous because they found their famous uh, exact formula for partitions, practically exact or exact in some sense, which is explained here. But since I talked about partitions in detail yesterday, I don't want to go back into that. So let me go back to the letter. But what I was saying is this. We know that there are the two faces of modular forms, and that's been kind of the main theme of this lecture, starting with the introduction on the first day, that on the one hand, it's a function with this infinite symmetry group, and that's why it has deep properties. From a modern point of view, it's you know, the, a section of a bundle over the moduli space of curves of one-pointed uh, curves of genus one, but, but it has this infinite transformation group. But from the other point of view, f becomes a function of q, just a power series, and now there's no symmetry at all, but the an are interest often, not necessarily, but usually and very often, interesting arithmetical functions. And second, the identities, so of the style a n equals b n, in other words, if I have two modular forms and I believe that they're equal, they become, well, I don't have room to write trivial, so I'll just write easy, but there's a mechanical way to check any identity. So the amazing thing is that a normal human being can do wonderful things with modular forms because of this richness by going back and forth. But only if you're Ramanujan can you live completely on this side, only using the Q expansions. He never used the modularity in any way and still discover very, very deep relationships and identities, some of which we still don't really quite know how he found. I can't say how he proved because he very often didn't prove things. He found them and wrote down, this is how it is. So those 100 formulas were all true, but they were not necessarily 100 theorems. We have no reason to think that he had proofs of all of them. Certainly, he never published proofs of most of them, but some, of course, he did. Later, when he came to England, of course, Hardy was a top analyst. Hardy did explain to him the basic theory of complex functions, Cauchy's theorem, and he learned sort of what a multiple form was, but he never really felt comfortable with it. And he didn't really need it because he already could do such wonderful things on the Q side. What he did know very well was asymptotics. So if you have this, one of the things you have, remember, is f of tau is f of minus 1 over tau, well, up to an automorphic factor. So typically, that means that f of, for instance, i epsilon, if you're very low in the half plane, will be, well, up to a factor, you know, i epsilon to the k, will be f of i over epsilon. But at infinity, we know exactly what this is. It's roughly let's say a0 if a0 is non-zero. So we have the asymptotics at zero, and also the asymptotics not just if you approach zero, but if you approach any rational point, p over q, well, q is bad, m over n, then since every rational point can be brought to infinity by an element of SL2z, you'll have asymptotics at every point. And Ramanujan was one of the great experts of history in using asymptotics intelligently, and he certainly knew these asymptotic properties, and that convinced him that certain identities were true, because they were not just true at infinity, but also true asymptotically, which means that he was secretly using the modularity, but he never used this infinite group or the notion of a group, so far as I know, and so on. It's a very, very interesting historical uh, situation. So that is uh, sort of Ramanujan and Hardy in this romantic story, and one of the early those sets of contributors to the theory of multiple forms. Neither one ever proved, even Hardy, a general theorem about multiple forms, but very, very many of the things that they studied, more Ramanujan, but both of them, and in particular the partitions that I showed you a minute ago and talked about yesterday, are in fact deeply connected with the theory of multiple forms. And certainly Hardy did know what they were and was well aware and even had a statement, which is actually wrong, that you could never find their formula without using the modularity properties. In fact, you can do it just with asymptotic properties but you can't prove it rigorously, but you can find it. So that's what I want to, to say, and these things explain a little bit what I've been telling you the last two days, in particular this magic principle and some applications to sums of two squares. But now I want to, uh, well, I might as well leave that up there for a minute, but don't, don't waste your time reading it. You've heard it all, I hope, much more clearly presented. I mean, here it's just summarized, a few, a few names of special functions. <laughs> 
So now I want to come to the theme of today's lectures, which are mock modular forms. And this starts, it's the other half of that story, and we'll come to that slide in a moment. It's the second half of that lecture. That the title of the lecture was Ramanujan and Hardy from the first letter to the last. So the first letter was January 1913. And the last letter, so that was the one where Hardy, uh, that Ramanujan wrote as a completely unknown person to Hardy who had never heard of him, introduced himself, and that's where their collaboration started. Then when he went back, as I said, in, after the war ended, he went back to India, and in 1920, uh, he became quite ill. He wrote in January, so exactly seven years later, and he died actually in April. So this was the last letter, well, the last mathematical letter, I think, of his life. And in that letter, uh, in 1920, he wrote, and he was very, very happy. He was otherwise, I said, quite depressed, tried to commit suicide. By that time, he knew he was sick. I don't know if he knew that it was fatal. He had, I think he had tuberculosis. I'm not sure. But in that letter, he's terribly happy. And he writes that he's made a wonderful discovery. So I'll show you the letter. And since it's undoubtedly illegible on the screen, I'll read it to you at the same time. So there it is, 12th of January, 1920, almost to the day. In fact, the other letter was the 13th of January. So the next day would have been the 10th anniversary. No, it was the 16th. But practically to the day, ten year, uh, seven years later, he writes to Hardy, I am extremely sorry for not writing you a single letter up to now. And then there's some more that I leave out. I discovered very interesting functions recently, which I called mock and he himself puts the mark in quotation marks, theta functions. Now, I've told you about theta functions in these lectures, and my theta functions were special functions like q to the n squared, or more generally, uh, q to some quadratic form in some variable running over some lattice. But for him, theta function, he just met the Jacobi theta function that he had learned about already in India as explicit functions found by Jacobi. And he meant functions that transform nicely, and it's exactly what we would call modular forms. So in, in his terminology, theta functions are simply mock modular forms. So that later, I, actually, I introduced the word mock modular forms because it's a more general class that includes his examples. So mock theta functions was his great discovery. I've discovered very interesting functions recently, which I call mock theta functions. Unlike the false theta functions of Rogers in his interesting paper, I won't talk about them, but they're in fact closely related, these enter into mathematics as beautifully as the ordinary uh, theta functions. In other words, he's claiming these are as beautiful as classical, true modular forms in a modern terminology. They enter into the theory as beautifully. I'm sending you with this letter some examples. And then there are 20 examples. Oh, seven, sorry, how did I come to 20? 17. He had actually quite a few more in his so-called lost notebook, which was never lost, but uh, hidden on the shelf by Watson and rediscovered sometime later. Anyway, uh, after his death, uh, so we know that actually he knew about 30 examples, uh, some of which were rediscovered before it was discovered that he had known them. But he gave 17 examples of this thing, but no definition. And so the 17... Well, 17, as you'll quickly see, is 4 plus 10 plus 3. So he gave four mock theta functions, I'll call them. I don't want to write it out all the time. Mock theta functions of order 3. And then he gave another 10 of order 5. And then he gave another 3 of order 7. And this was also all very well, except that there's no definition at all of what a mock theta function is, nor is there any definition at all of what order 3, 5, or 7 means. And pe people puzzled over it for the best part of 100 years. So it was, that's also part of this uh, very mysterious story, you know, like Fairmont writing in the margin. He left behind this text, which was obviously, there was a great deal behind it, unlike Fermat's text, which nobody seriously believes that he had approved, but he had a beautiful discovery. But here he had tumbled on something utterly wonderful. He knew it was wonderful. He said that. And he said they have wonderful properties. But all he said in the letter was negative properties. He said they're not modular forms, but they're a little like them. They have similar asymptotics, but not the same. 
and they don't have quite the asymptotic. So it was all kind of some properties, but vague properties. If you simply define every function that has all of those properties he said, you get a huge and meaningless class. He wanted functions which had a very good property. And so if you remember here the key thing, this thing about identities, I called it, I think, the magical principle. I certainly did in, in that lecture. And the magical principle, remember, in that case, was that if you have ordinary modular forms, so for ordinary modular forms, the magical principle, so I'm, I'm going to define it, is if f and g are modular forms, having, first of all, the same weight. Remember, the weight is an absolutely key uh, invari uh, invariant, which is the k from c to plus d to the k. But even without knowing a technical thing, one, one could just say modular forms have certain invariants. And the most crucial one is called the weight. And it's an integer or half integer. And if things have different weights, they're certainly going to be different. So if I want f and g to be the same, which should be the conclusion, uh, then they should certainly have the same weight. Then they should have the same level. So the, the weight is, you know, we have this f of a tau plus b over c tau plus d is c tau plus d to the k. I'm just reminding you, f of tau, and the weight is this number k, and this is for all a, b, c, d in some group gamma, which may be contained in gamma 1, which is SL2z. So it's either SL2z or subgroup, and the level is which particular group. So it might be a subgroup of index 30, and then you need a little more information than if it were on the whole group, because it's got less symmetry. And finally, the same first few Fourier coefficients. In other words, f is the sum a and q to the n, g is the sum b and q to the n, and a n equals b n for n going from 0 to, let's say, 100. And the first few is a specific number. It might be 2, it might be 100. It depends how big the weight is, how big the level is. Roughly, it's the, if you know what the level is exactly, if it's the product of the weight and the level divided by 12, roughly. So anyway, it's a specific number. Then, I don't know if you can still see it here because of the thing, so I'll put it here. Then. So that's the end of that sentence, then f equals g. In other words, to prove any identity among two arithmetic sequences that may be very interesting, like numbers of representations of a number is the sum of four squares, and the sum of the divisors is some restriction uh, of the number, if you want to prove such an identity, and if both sides happen by luck to be the coefficients of modular forms, then you have a mechanical way to prove it. You just compute some invariance. The weight, the level, and the first uh, 33 Fourier coefficients are usually the first one or two in practice, and then you're done. So you don't have to prove anything. The theorem is a pure computer or hand or computer verification, depending how big the numbers are. So this is a wonderful principle. And the question that one could ask is, is there a way to make sense of Ramanujan's notion of mock modular forms such that they become such a specific object, these mock model forms, I'll give you some of the 17 examples in a moment, they still have Fourier expansions like this. So they're still Q series, but they no longer transform under any model group the right way. But they're not completely off. There was clearly a connection, that's what Ramanujan saw, and I'll show you in a minute how he knew that it, there was a true connection with the theory of usual modular forms, but they weren't modular, and therefore you didn't have this magic principle. And so the really big question was, can you make sense of this and make the whole thing come back to life? And in particular, I'm going to add, uh, if I replace ordinary by mock, then, as we'll see in a moment, there's one more invariant. And I'm going to leave it blank for the moment. The same something. You can't see it anyway, depending where you're sitting. But believe me, it says the same something that I haven't specified. Then they're equal. And that something is, again, calculable. So again, we're in the good world that if you found some interesting arithmetic functions, and it turns out now there are many more. We already had many interesting arithmetic functions that came as coefficients of modular forms. Now we have a much bigger class, and it doesn't disappoint us. There are many new interesting arithmetic functions, like class numbers of imaginary quadratic fields that occur here, but not here, but not in the original world. But that wouldn't help us unless we had a variant of the magical principle, and that's exactly what we have. So that problem was open for 82 years.
And during those years, Watson, and I'll just maybe mention three or four of the most famous names that were connected, Selberg, Hickerson is not such a famous mathematician, but made one of the big contributions to this field. Andrews is a very famous combinatorialist, but many, many other people. There was a lot of, of work, especially Watson who wrote many papers. It's the Watson of Whitaker and Watson and of the treatise on Bessel functions. And he came to this puzzle, you know, the final, he spoke of the final solution. Of course, it was before World War II, so he didn't know. The final solution, meaning the final enigma in the sense of Sherlock Holmes, what was the meaning of Ramanujan's last letter? And he gave very good partial answers. And some part of the later theory is visible in Watson's work. Selberg did something very interesting. There were many papers. In this paper where Ramanujan gave his 17 examples, he gave also many formulas, many identities. There were no proofs. And all of those were then proved during those years. But for instance, the last ones were proved by Hickerson, I think in 1990, around then, in a nearly 100-page paper in Inventionis. So, you know, the best part of a century later, in a top journal, it was very, very difficult. So even the identities, which were completely well-defined, they were just formulas. But they were much harder to prove than for multiple forms because you didn't have the magical principle. Now that we do have it, as I've already hinted, uh, all of them become trivial. That paper of Hickerson, you can now just say theorem and then write trivial because you check that these invariants agree and, and you're finished. But without that theory, you have to do it using only combinatorial properties, and it was very hard. So in around 2000, I, was, uh, I had a professorship in Holland part-time, like the one here, and I had a young student called Sanders Wegers. And he was very good with uh, formulas and with the Hilai Pramanujan. So I suggested that he work on mock theta functions and maybe you know, find some more identities like the ones Ramanujan had found, or maybe some more examples. There were 30 examples known. I, of course, didn't suggest that he should try to solve a century-old problem. I mean, it was only supposed to be a PhD. But in fact, he, he did solve it. Actually, I suggested two things he could work on, quite separate, uh, I thought. And both, I said, of course, you can't solve them, but, but maybe do something in that direction. The other was indefinite theta series. And he sort of solved the other one, too, at least in a huge special case. And it showed that it was the same thing, that the indefinite theta series gave examples and could be used to form the whole theory of mock theta functions, which I hadn't even suspected. So a very, very impressive uh, thesis that he wrote in 2002 in Utrecht. And then he decided that he wasn't really cut out to do mathematics and quit. And luckily, two or three years later, it was possible to talk him into changing his mind. And he accepted a math job again in Ireland and, and later came to Germany, as now uh, in, in Cologne. So he came back to the world of mathematics. But for some reason, he thought, oh, I'm not sure if I'm good enough for this game. You know, people are strange. Anyway, a fantastic uh, thesis that opened up a whole new field. And there are many, many contributions since. I'll mention some of the names. Maybe, maybe I won't. So we now know the answer to the puzzle. There is an answer, and I'll come to it. But first, I want to go back to Ramanujan's letter. So here, if you have uh, links like eyes, you can see some of those formulas. But I'll give not all 17, of course. It would take too long. But I'll give a few of the formulas just to give you a feeling for, for how it works. So let me go back now to Ramanujan's letter. And the order three that he talked about. Remember, I just erased it. There were four order three functions. You don't know what order three means, but nor does anyone else, or at least nor did anyone else until Zweigers. So he had four functions, and he called them f, phi, psi, and chi. And to add to the confusion, when he got to the order five, he again called them f, phi, psi, and chi, and a fifth letter that I've forgotten. And to make it worse, there were 10, but they came in pairs, and he called both of them f and f rather than f1 and f2. So he, and then again, for order 7, he used f. So it's a slightly confusing notation. I'm going to suppress chi because I won't need it. And I'll also change in his phi and I'll change the sign of q just to make the formulas better, as I did in uh, gave a Bourbaki talk on Zweigert's work several years ago. And I'm copying formulas from that. So let me give those three functions. That will give you a feeling. So maybe you remember from yesterday's lecture that I had the example, there was a pair, G and H, the Rogers Ramanujan functions, and they were defined by Q to the N squared over 1 minus Q up to 1 minus Q to the N, and H was a similar formula. And those were modular functions, true modular functions, actually of weight zero in this case, if you multiply it by a suitable power. You should actually put 
q to the minus the 60th here and here q to the 11 60th times the power series with integral exponents. So those series of that kind, Ramanujan called Eulerian because Euler uh, studied them very much. And I like calling everything after Euler that Euler did and not after later people. But in this case, nobody calls them that anymore. They're called Q hypergeometric series, uh, which simply means if you look at this nth term, this is a sum, n from 0 to infinity. But if you look at the nth term, let's call this a n, then you see that the ratio, a n is the previous term. And then downstairs, you've just multiplied by a single factor 1 minus q to the n. And upstairs, you've multiplied, in this case, by q to the 2n minus 1. So this is a fixed rational function independent of n of q and q to the n. I mean, if n is fixed like 5, then rational functions in q and q to the fifth is just rational functions in q. But this is a fixed function. n can vary, and it's some function like here, q to the n squared times 1 over q over 1 minus q to the n. So that's what we call today a hypergeometric, q hypergeometric function. Ordinary hypergeometric is the same, but this would be a rational function, let's say, over q or c of n. That would be usual hypergeometric. That's the reason for this name. OK, so let's consider these q hypergeometric or Eulerian uh, series, and all of Ramanujan's examples were like that. And that, by the way, is why it took so long. It's a complete fluke when you have a formula like this. This is Q-hypergeometric, and it's also multiter. But the two fields, they're both huge fields. There are many, many books on Q-hypergeometric series. They have a third name called Basic Hypergeometric Series. Many of the books are called that. So there's a huge field of, of Q-hypergeometric series. And of course, a huge field of multiple forms, as I've been convincing you. But the overlap is tiny. It's a sheer fluke when a Q-hypergeometric series is multiple and vice versa. And so in the case of mock multiple forms, since there was no definition, people only had these examples. And they were all Q-hypergeometric. So everybody concentrated on that. And what Svegers did is he looked at the proofs of the identities in literature. And he saw that they used one of three classes. In each case, people had shown that one of these Q-hypergeometric things could be, by combinatorial tricks, put into another class. And that class was not Q-hypergeometric. So he wrote three classes, and he thought, maybe I can figure out what one of them is. But in fact, he figured out what all three were. Each one had a special transformation law, a modification of the usual symmetry of a modular form. And to his surprise, and my surprise too, each of those three transformation laws was the same. So each of the three classes of non-hypergeometric forms that people had used to prove the identities turned out to have a common property. And so that common property that was Zweiger's discovery to crystallize that out, that's the one that I then dubbed mock modular forms. So as I said, theta functions to Ramanujan meant multiple forms. So mock modular form is something with this mysterious property, which I'll come to in a moment, which turned out also very useful for physics. Oh, actually, in many places in physics, I'll only mention one or two. So I'm coming back now to the examples. As I said, they're all going to be Q-hypergeometric. So in the case of order three, I've, I've just erased it. But I told you that I was going to have three functions. And I'll just copy them from the paper, because from my handwritten notes, I can't read it. So here we do exactly like this G of Q. It's exactly the same, except that it isn't, of course, because if it were exactly the same, then it would be the same function, and it would be modular. We make two changes. First of all, all the minuses become plus. And secondly, we square the denominator. OK, so that's called f of q. So this is all I'm doing order of three. And as I told you, he gave four. And I'm giving three of them, but changing the sign in phi and psi. Phi of q is very similar. For Ramanujan, it was again q to the n squared. But for me to make the formulas better, it's minus n squared times 1. And this time, it's like that. But the square has descended inside, so it's 1 plus q squared up to 1 plus q to the n squared, and no square outside. And finally, psi of q, again, for Ramanujan, the, the numerator had a q to the n squared, but then he needed minuses later in his formula. So I'm simplifying by this. And this time, you again put 1 plus q. But instead of taking everything twice, you take only the odd ones, but you go twice as far. So they sort of have the feeling that they're all in the same ballpark, but you certainly don't see what they have to do with each other. And now, as I told you, Ramanujan had many identities. So in this case, let me write down the two identities that he had. So Ram Ramanujan claimed, and that was certainly proved later, I think, by Watson already, the, the order three ones, the identities were not terribly hard. It was the order seven that Hickerson worked so hard. 
So if you take 2 times phi minus f, it doesn't matter what the coefficients are, but a linear combination of those two, then it's going to be something very nice, which I'll write in a second. But if you also take f of q plus 4 psi of q, well, then it's also the same very nice thing. So if I add these two functions before I write this, if I add those two and divide by two, I will also get this relationship. So before I even write the right-hand side of your second identity, we already have that you have quite separate things, but they satisfy identities. Well, that should ring a bell with multiple forms. We had, for instance, E4 squared and E8, and they were completely differently defined as Q series. But because the space was such a small dimension, in that case dimension one, they had to be equal. And similarly with delta E4 cubed and E6 squared, there were three functions, but because the space was only two dimensional, there had to be a relation. Well, shades of the same thing. Here you have three functions that have nothing obvious to do with each other. There's no obvious way to see that phi is f plus two psi. But if it's true that there's a generalization of multiple forms, some mock multiple forms, which is a very specific space with this magic principle, and if it happens to be two-dimensional, well, then there's got to be a relationship. And of course, uh, Ramanujan will find it, at least numerically. Whether he proved this again, I, I have no idea, but it's true. So, but it's even better. Not only are these two combinations equal, and therefore these three functions actually span a two-dimensional space. That's the only relationship between them. But also these two combinations, which are equal by that, and I'll write it exactly the way that he did, So he wrote it exactly like this, this is from his letter, as a quotient where the numerator is the alternating sign of q to the n squared. Remember when you take q to the n squared, every square except zero comes twice because nine is the square of both three and minus three. So here this is the sum, uh, the, the numerator would be the sum minus q to the n squared, which is in fact exactly what we have here anyway. And the denominator, as you see, is an infinite product. It's just like the dedicant eta function, except the dedicate eta function, remember, that I talked about yesterday, well, there's q to the 124th, but then it's 1 minus q to the n times 1 minus, sorry, 1 minus q, 1 minus q squared. And here it's 1 plus. But if you simply remember that 1 plus x is 1 minus x squared over 1 minus x, then you immediately see that if I double tau and then take the quotient, I'll again get q to the 1 over 24, but now it's 1 plus q, 1 plus q squared. And so we immediately see, from a modern point of view, that this thing is q to the, to make it multiply, I should multiply it by 1 over 24. So this is q to the 1 over 24 times a modular function, I think. But it might be q to the minus 1 over so this on the right is a true modular function. Sorry, it's not a modular function, it's a modular form. Eta has weighed a half, but this quotient with, with minus signs. But the quote with plus signs, it's a quotient. A half minus a half is zero. It is weight zero. And so the denominator is weight zero, the top is weight a half. So this actually modular form, which I always abbreviate MF, of weight a half. So now we see something really beautiful. This was in, of course, Ramanujan didn't say it about its being a multiform. form. As I said, he never really knew what a multiform form was, or if he knew, he didn't terribly much care. But this very much suggests that we have a bigger space, which I'll write with a double, you know, black fold. So mk is modular forms, where maybe I don't specify the level for the moment. Modular forms of weight k. And then there should be a notion of a bigger space of mock modular forms. And these are true modular forms. And we'll have a bigger space. Well, depending on the level, it might happen to be the same. It might be bigger. And in this case, you can fantasize, and of course, it's exactly right, that if you insert the q to the 124, plus or minus, I probably got it wrong. But if you put the same power, it has to be the same power each time, because we had a linear relation, remember. But if you put the correct power of q to the 124 of q in front of each of these, then they will belong to a three-dimensional space, a two-dimensional space here, which will contain a one-dimensional space of modular forms. And that means since it's a two-dimensional space, but there are three of them, they have to be linearly dependent. But since that two-dimensional space contains a one-dimensional space of mock modular forms, given any two of them, like phi and f or f and psi, there will be a linear combination, which is that unique modular form, uh, which here will be this one again with the power q to the 1 over 24. And that's exactly how it works. So this example actually already tells us a little bit what's going on.
And as I already told you, it's not like Ramanujan understood nothing he, about this, that it was complete mystery and just writing down identities. He did know, as I said, a great deal about asymptotics. And he proved an asymptotic statement. I'll just write it for f, but he had similar statements probably for all of his functions, certainly for some of them. He wrote them out. And he said this, that if I take t going to 0, and I look at f of minus e to the minus pi t, so this is the q, and so it's tending to minus 1. So in the unit circle, q is going to minus 1. But if you think of q as e to the 2 pi t, uh, tau, then you see that tau would be simply 1 plus i t over 2, because then e to the 2 pi times a half is minus e to the 2 pi times i t over 2 is e to the minus pi t. So in the upper half plane, we have the point 0, we have the point 1, here we have the point a half, and we're descending, we're very, very close to the point a half. So to find the asymptotics there, if it were multiple, it would be easy. You would use the multiple behavior to send that point, which is very near this rational point, to some very high point, and then you just use the Q series. And so if you did that, uh, this is, uh, I didn't finish the phrase, it's uh, 24. And that you see the 24 is exactly the 24th already had, that you have to take Q to the minus 1 24th. Uh, yeah, it's correct, yeah. This is the Q to the 1 24th, so Q to the minus 1 24th F, etc. They are going to be the mock multiple forms. And they have a negative power in front, as it happens. So, okay, so that means if these were modular, then you would just have an identity. Since they're not modular, something will happen. And so if it were modular, you would simply use the modularity, and you would push this thing, this thing, to find its asymptotics. You would go from this point near a half to a point near infinity, and you would get a formula, and that, that, would, that formula would include t to the weight. Uh, minus the weight, but the weight is a half. So it would have a, a 1 over squared of t. And then it would start with a constant, which would be 1, except that our function doesn't start with 1. It starts q to the minus 1, 24. So it would actually start with a power pi over 24 over t, because now we've inverted t using the multinarity. So if we had this to very high order, let me say this very slowly. If this were a modular form of weight a half, then typically this thing on the left would have a formula like this, some pure exponential in e to the pi over t, t to the minus the weight, which here is t to the minus a half, and then the next term would be another exponential, which might be, for instance, e to the minus 23 over 24 times pi over t, because, and so on, so it would be exponentially smaller than the first term. Well, he also finds that the next term is exponentially smaller than the first term, because t is very small, so this is exponentially big, but it's not 4 over the square root of t. It would have to be if it were modular. Instead, he just writes it's 4 plus little o of 1. So he writes the difference looks like 4. But if it were modular, it would look like 4 over the square root of t or some other constant. So it already doesn't look modular. And actually, we know, and he probably knew, that actually it's a whole power series in t. And that's completely different from a modular form. A modular form, the next term would be a constant, but with a different exponential, with the square root of t. But then there would just be one term, and the next would be, again, exponentially much smaller. But here, once you get to the 4, there are infinitely many terms which are not exponentially different. They're just different by powers of t, which is small, but not exponentially small. So it's a completely different asymptotic behavior. And this he knew, well, he probably knew all of it, but what he said is just this plus little o of 1. So that much he gave. So he gave a very strong clue that these things were close to modular forms in two ways. First of all, they have asymptotics, which resembles very much the asymptotics of a modular form. There is this change of t goes to 1 over t, but it's subtly different. And secondly, he showed that there was an actual connection with modular forms, because you could take two of his mock modular forms, actually in different ways, and find a linear combination, which was a true modular form. So that was the story before. And maybe I won't give the other functions for the moment, but I'll say something about order 5 and order 7. So for order 5, it's clear already from the description he gives. I told you that he gave five functions. But actually, the five, and I even told you, he only used five letters and used the same letter twice, chi, and he said, here's another family. Chi, we would call chi 1 and chi 2. So there's a chi 1 and chi 2, and then again an f and a phi and a psi and another Greek letter. But then he showed that each vector, each column of this matrix, is equal to a linear combination. I mean, any two 
columns of this matrix, some linear combination of them is truly modular. So again, and also they're dependent again. So again, the full space is dimension less than five, but it's now vector-valued forms, and there's a subspace of multiple forms, and the co-dimension is one. So there's really only one new one, which I can call chi vector, which would be chi one of tau, chi two of tau. I might write the formulas later. I probably won't. They're very similar again to the Hardy Ramanujan. They look almost the same. And similarly, for the seven, there he had three. And here you notice these were one tuples. There was no vector. That's because three minus one over two is one. Five minus one over two is two, so they're vectors of length two, and seven minus one over two is three. So in the third case, there aren't any identities with multiple forms. And so he has three functions. He just calls them all f, but I would number them now f1, f2, f3. And again, well, here, no combination of this multiple. This is just a single mock object, and actually he gives no identity. So in a sense, he says nothing at all, but nevertheless, one easily checks that these are somehow related to multiple forms. There are many ways to, to check that without understanding exactly what's happening. So that was the mystery, and I want to tell briefly Zweig's uh, re resolution of it, and then even more briefly uh, talk about the application in physics. So, So the resolution is this, and I can put the mysterious word, and if you can't see it, I'll just say it very loud, shadow. So every modular form, every mock modular form, has, the word is invented by me, but the notion was uh, from Zweiger's thesis, I called it the shadow. If you have a mock modular form, like one of these three, of Brahman and John, then it has associated to it a shadow. And the shadow is a true modular form of weight two minus the original form. So in this case, these Ramanujan's examples all had weight a half, but there are many examples of other weights today. And therefore, the shadow would have had weight three halves. So now what would happen, and this thing is calculable, if you have, you cannot read it off just from the Q-series. But that's like usual multiple forms from the Q-series, you see nothing. You need a proof that your particular Q-series is a multiple form. It has to come from Eisenstein series, theta series, L functions for elliptic curve, it has to come from something of which you've proved the modularity. Nobody can read off the modularity. But if you have a mock modular form, and similarly you have some proof that it's mock modular, that proof will include the shadow. So the shadow is just as calculable as the weight, the level, the first few Fourier coefficients, and, uh, uh, well, as those three things. And so what you have is you have this shadow map, and then the kernel, if the shadow is zero, or rather if it's modular, the shadow is zero, and if the shadow is zero, it's modular. So this is exact. If you're not used to the level of exact sequence, this just says there's a shadow, and the shadow of a form is zero if and only if it's true modular form. And so we have a bigger space, but you detect the non-modularity, what the physicists would call the modular anomaly. You detect that with the shadow, which is not a number, but itself a modular form. But remember that a modular form, although it's not a single number, it's an infinite power series, but it itself is described by a finite amount of data. Its weight, which is 2 minus k, its level, and the first few Fourier coefficients. So in other words, it's completely calculable. And in that way, as I've already said, any identity, like these three identities that I wrote down, or the much harder ones for order 7, that Hickerson became famous by proving, all of them now become trivial. You say, well, it's not quite trivial. You have to show that Ramanujan's functions really were mock modular forms in the sense of the current definition. But that Zweikers did in his thesis for all, all 17 cases. And, it's, and often he did it in three ways, because as I told you, each of these functions was in three different classes. So that's not hard. And once you know that, then the identity is trivial. You just compute by hand or by computer the, the weight, the level, the first few Fourier coefficients, and the shadow. And if they all agree, well, then the functions are equal. And the proof is now clear. If f and g have the same shadow, then f minus g is shadow zero. So it's modular. But they have the same level, the same weight, and the same few coefficients. And so I use the previous principle. So now we can prove all of these identities in a marvelous way. And I've already said I'll give one example. Actually, it was the first example of a mock modular form ever. And it's due to me, but I never had any idea that it was a mock multiple form. I didn't see that. But I wrote down a property which, in Zweger's world, turned out to be the definition of a mock multiple form. It was, of course, many years after Ramanujan, but I wrote down the mock multiple property. And I won't give the, the complete definition, but I'll just say if you take the sum h of nq to the n, and this is some class number. It's called the horvitz kronecker class number. It's a very famous version. It's roughly the class number of the quadratic field q of the square root of minus n. 
And if n is a fundamental discriminant and not minus 3 or minus 4, or not 3 or 4, it actually is that. Otherwise, it's a small modification. Anyway, this thing I actually showed in a paper 20 years before Zweigers uh, that this is a mock modular form of weight 3 Hausdorff. I simply wrote down a formula. I had no idea that that was part of a general class. And that, so I wrote down a certain property. And now I'll tell you what that certain property is. So here's Zweigers' property, or here's the definition of a mock modular form as given by Zweigers' work. So as I said, if you have a mock modular form, then you have to find, and this is a bit mysterious, you have to write down in each case a shadow. But the easiest way to do it, certainly it works in the 17 cases, is you just guess. And once you guess, then you write down what I'm going to write down. And if it works, then you guess right. And if it didn't work, you guess again. So there's not a well-defined process how to find it. It's unique, but we don't know. There's no algorithm just looking at the Q series. But G will be an ordinary modular form. This is the shadow. OK? So this function is, remember, some sum a n q to the n. And I'll simplify a little sum slightly lying, but it's very close. b n q to the n. OK? And now you make a new function out of g in a completely algorithmic way. This is easy, algorithmic. And I'll just write it down. This is called the non-holomorphic Eichler integral. I'm not even going to write it down. But you simply take the same function. And remember, this q to the n is e to the 2 pi i n tau. But now that means it's a certain function, e to the 2 pi i tau. But you re replace tau by n tau. So now I'm going to take a slightly different function. And that function roughly, this is something of a lie, but it's very similar to that. Uh, I'll just put with some constants that don't matter at all. n times y, where y is the imaginary part of tau. And erfc, well, erfc is the so-called complementary error function. And it's not quite right. There's a factor, and it depends on the weight. This is for weight 3 halves. It might be a slightly different function. But depending on the weight, there's a specific function of one variable, which I'll call the complementary error function, because it's very close to that. For those of you who don't know it, that's roughly the function, the integral from x to infinity, e to the minus t squared dt. So it's the function that is the tail of the Gaussian. Well, from the square root of x. So it's roughly like e to the minus x. And there's a constant in front. And the result is very nice. Ah, because I lied. I forgot the most important thing. It's e to the minus 2 pi i n t. So if you didn't have this, then this would diverge, because tau is in the upper half plane. So minus tau is in the lower half plane. So e to the minus 2 pi tau is bigger than 1 in absolute value. And so if you didn't have this factor, this would diverge. But actually, what you have here, you know, there's some 4 pi n y. I'll put in a little more. And this error function in the version I want would be, let's say, from the square root of x to infinity e to the minus 2 squared. It's roughly like e to the minus x. So though this diverges like e to the minus 2 pi n tau, this goes to 0 like e to the plus e to the minus 4 pi n y. This is e to the plus 2 pi n y. And so the whole thing converges just as quickly as q to the n, just in a different way. So it doesn't matter. The actual formula, it happens to be very nearly this. This is, as I said, slightly oversimplified, but you can find the formula. You know, it's written down in many places. But it's completely algorithmic. This is just a well-known function. It's in every book on classical you know, special functions, like the gamma function. And your computer has it. So this is a completely well-defined series. And now what do you do with it? So far, I've just said to f, we associate this mysterious g, which is a holomorphic form g, its shadow. And then g star is this non-holomorphic thing, which is no longer modular. But now I define the completion. And this is exactly the definition. The completion, f hat of tau, is you simply take f of tau and you add this non-holomorphic piece. The non-holomorphic piece is non-holomorphic, which is bad. This is holomorphic, which is good. But this is, has unknown properties. But this is explicit, because we started with the multiple form. And I hope I've convinced you that we know multiple forms of a given weight and level kind of completely. So g, and therefore also g star, are completely known. So you add something non-holomorphic, but completely explicit. And after you make this correction, this thing is modular. It's not a modular form in the sense of my definition of the last two days, because it's not holomorphic. But it does satisfy, since I raised it, I'll have to write it again. It satisfies on the nose the usual modularity property with the same weight as before. 
So in other words, Ramanujan was utterly right that these things are very close to multiple forms. They are multiple after you complete them by adding a non-holomorphic piece. And this is something that in physics happens all the time, that you're required to do these some failure of gauge invariant, some where forces you to add a correction term, and then everything comes out right, but you lose things like holomorphy. So I mean, let's say this is a familiar kind of an idea in mathematics. And here it worked like a charm. So for instance, if you do that, for this vector-valued form, I won't write it out, I was going to, but it would take too long. If you do it for this vector-valued form of uh, order five, then although chi one and chi two actually will have level five, that turns out to be more or less what Ramanujan meant, but the vector-valued thing will actually look very, very similar to what I wrote yesterday for the Rodas Ramanujan. I'm sure you've forgotten, but I'll write the corresponding thing here. That if you take, if you, I won't put the vector anymore, I'll just put chi for chi 1, chi 2, and then complete. That completed thing trivially will change by roots of unity, sorry, I left out the power, to the minus 1 to the 49, simply because each of these chi 1s, I haven't written them down, but this is q to the minus 120 times something with integer coefficients. So therefore, this, is, this part is trivial, but what's not at all trivial is that you get something with the square root of tau, and then some constant, and then a two by two matrix is actually essentially the same as I wrote yesterday for Rodas Ramanujan, sorry, here, minus one over tau, and then again, chi of tau. So here, the two individual functions have some level five, but the whole vector value function, which Ramanujan already clearly saw, and he wrote them in pairs, and here wrote as a triple, that whole thing actually transforms under the full multiple group. So he, he had, a, it's, you know, it's an absolutely beautiful discovery, and he found this. Now, now, I do want to skip a little because time is running out and I want to say something about the physics story. So, just to say briefly, first, the, the history of it. I was invited to a conference in Paris that I would have usually not gone because the title started Black Holes and I knew at that time exactly nothing about black holes. Now I know not exactly nothing. Uh, but still nothing, but not exactly nothing. But the, the title was irresistible. It was called Black Holes and Modular Forms. And I mean, of course, you couldn't keep me away with the 10-foot pole. I was asked to give just an expository talk explaining multiple forms to physicists working on black hole theory. And there were many wonderful lectures. One was by Ashok Sen, and he explained something the physicists had done which about counting certain quantum states of black holes in a string theory of black holes. But there was a mystery. These counting functions were related to multiple forms, to so-called Ziegel multiple forms, but they couldn't themselves be the coefficients of anything multiple because they exhibited what was called, in both physics and mathematics, a wall-crossing phenomenon. So they depended on an auxiliary parameter, some high-dimensional moduli space, and in that space, there are co-dimension one subspace, or walls, and when you cross them, when your modulus crosses, these numbers jump. And of course, you know, modular forms are not supposed to jump. They're supposed to be integers and be discrete and number theory. And so that completely messed up their being modular. And so there was a mystery, what are these things? So it took me, you know, 10 seconds or one second to solve the mystery, not because I'm so smart, but because Sanders Vegas had written in his thesis exactly the same thing. Namely, he showed that in one of the three approaches to mock modular forms, which, which was so-called Fourier coefficients of meromorphic Jacobi forms, I don't want to go into it at all, he showed that you have exactly the same phenomenon. There's a wall crossing, and what's left after you allow for it by adding this correction term suddenly no longer jumps when you cross the wall. It's a well-defined power series, and therefore it has coefficients that count something. But that one is no longer modular, it's mock modular. So I went up to, to Sen immediately after the lecture, I introduced myself, we hadn't met before. Of course, he's a well-known ICTP person, he's on the Scientific Council here, and, and, old visitor, and I said, uh, I know the solution, I can't yet show it, but it'll be easy, it'll take a week. Uh, it's in the th thesis of my student that's not yet well known, even in mathematics or in physics. That will be the solution. These things are going to be mock modular forms. So he said, great, why don't you work with, uh, with my friend Atish Dabolkar, who's sitting there and is now, like me, permanently affiliated to the ICTP, but unlike me, properly and not uh, in a quantum state. So he's actually here, and quite recently, and I hope you're happy about it. I'm very happy about it. And we started working, and after a few days, it was clear that this was not going to be done in, in one week. And then he said, do you mind if I bring I have a bright postdoc, if I remember correctly, Samir Murthy, who became a very close friend of mine. He's now in England. 
And uh, he's even more associated with the ICTP. He was an, a postdoc here. He was here for four years. And not only learned fluent Italian, he's the only foreigner I know. I mean, I'm sure there are many, but the only one I know who learned Trestino dialect, which is kind of amazing. He learned it because he gave tango lessons. And when you give tango lessons, you have to talk to the, you know, you go to the bar afterwards and talk. And of course, the students were not physicists and mathematicians. They were Triestini, and they spoke dialect. So he, he speaks, I don't know how well, but anyway, he knows Triestino dialect, which impressed me no end. So it's a completely uh, Trieste kind of a collaboration. And the two weeks that I estimated turned out to be four years, which made both of my collaborators furious with me, but they didn't know, you know what, what slow meant until they met me. Anyway, we, we wrote a huge paper, 150 pages, that's going to come out very soon, as a, I hope, as a book in the Cambridge University Press. And we worked out this connection using what Zweigers had done, but applying it to the physical model. And I, I obviously can't go into details for time and for understanding and for probably your understanding, since it's mostly mathematicians here. And even if you're physicists, not necessarily uh, string theorists of black holes, because it's a fairly specialized domain. But I'll say a few words about it. Maybe I read something from the abstract, or actually there was an earlier abstract that says it even better in an earlier version of the paper, no longer the one on the archive. I mean, one that is not, not the one on the archive. I'll read a sentence. It's meant to be mysterious to you. It certainly was to me, although I think now I know what all the words mean. We show that the generating function, that's a word you've seen, of quantum degeneracies of single-centered black holes in n equals four string theories is, that's the generating function, is a mock modular form. That was the one sentence summary of the whole 150-page paper. And then it went on. The failure of modularity is governed by the shadow, which itself is a true modular form. So, and then it went on to explain a little. So let me just say a few words. Well, first, I have to also read a very well-known quote that we put as kind of a half-dedication in our paper. It was a quote from uh, Freeman Dyson at the Ramanujan Centenary in 1987, since he was born in 1887. And he wrote, and we felt we'd done at least part of that, and actually Atish wrote to me, got a nice answer, that the thank you. I'll read it someday when I have a few extra years. My dream, said Freeman Dyson, very famous physicist, mathematical physicist, my dream is that I will live to see the day when our young physicists, struggling to bring the predictions of superstring theory into correspondence with the facts of nature, something we'd all like to see happen someday, will be led to enlarge their analytic machinery to include not only theta functions, but mock theta functions. But before this can happen, the purely mathematical exploration of the mock modular forms, so he actually invented the word, and their mock symmetries must be carried a great deal further. And that's exactly what's done by this, because by, since this is a true modular form, by integrating the symmetry of this, the modularity behavior, you find out exactly the failure of modularity here. And since this is actually modular, it has no failure, that's the same as the failure of modularity here. So what this implies is exactly what Freeman Dyson said, that the original F, with before you complete, F itself, is of course not modular, because then it would be an ordinary modular form, but it's holomorphic. So the difference, the failure of modularity is holomorphic, and this is explicit. And of course, it's determined completely by G. So it's a completely different form, not the one I wrote, not non-holomorphic, a different thing in some integral or some sum, but there's a completely explicit function that you write down once you know the shadow G, and that tells you the failure of modularity. And if G is zero, well, then it was modular, and there's no failure. So it's uh, Freeman Dyson, who's you know, fantastic, person still, by the way, going strong. I met him for the first time a few months ago. He was 90, gave a fantastic lecture. He's uh, full of beans and full of ideas and very impressive. And his wife, who's presumably much the same age, still runs marathons, which I can't even think about. Anyway, uh, so he predicted, or he said it would be wonderful if someday this could enter the machinery of string theory. And to do that, you would need to first understand the mock symmetries of mock modular forms. And that's what has happened. So let me just say, basically I can say nothing, I think, about the uh, physics background. I wrote down a few notes in case I said a few words. I mean, I also took the you know, opening pages of the paper with me so that I could look at formulas. Roughly, I told you that there's a moduli space and that for any point in that moduli space, 
you get a power series which counts something, what they call the quantum degeneracies, which we would call the dimensions of the eigenspaces of certain operators. And so that moduli space, well, first I should say, what string theory is it? It's a type two string theory based on string theory, as I mentioned earlier, that you have a three-dimensional Calabial times Sir Minkowski four space. So this is the string theory where x3 in this product, x is itself a product of a K3 surface, which I've also mentioned, and a two torus. And there's a famous duality, and you can also do, this would be a type two string theory, you can also do a so-called heterotic string theory on something else which turns out to be T4 times T2, or simply T6. And then some wonderful duality that's 25 years old by now, and also very mysterious, certainly to me, tells you that you get the same numbers and everything works nicely. It's again some kind of, I think some kind of mirror story, or I don't know what kind of a story, some kind of a brain story probably. So this is where we're living. And so T2, well, T2, as I said already in earlier lectures, it's C modulo lattice. That corresponds to H modulo SL2Z. So you have a moduli space, but if you go to the universal covering, the discrete group that's acting is SL2Z. But the other one, K3, K3s, there are a lot of K3s, and it's a 20-dimensional space, but actually here it's even a bit bigger. It's a so-called 226. So it's an orthogonal group of size 28, so 28 by 28 matrices with that signature over Z. And roughly of this group, or not, I don't know if it's, it is, in fact, the product acting. And so if you think you don't have to know any of the words that I'm saying, what this acts on, well, SL2Z acts on, two by, on vectors of length 2 of integers, and 28 by 28 integral matrices act on vectors of length 28. So you have altogether 56 quantum numbers. And the first row of this, those 56 correspond somehow to the, in one version, in one frame, to the electric quantum numbers, the other to the magnetic. So this is the, uh, I think, the S numbers and the T numbers. There's no point in my trying to say all the right words since I don't know what they mean. You won't know what they mean even if I get them right, unless you do know what they mean, and then you'll know I get them wrong. So it's called the S modulus and the T modulus. But anyway, we have a whole bunch of quantum numbers. So now we're down to something very simple. We just have to study some integers that depend on, twin, on 56 numbers, plus maybe some more stuff. So that looks pretty hopeless. Uh, but then it turns out that because of this group duality, the thing that depends on this matrix is independent, is invariant under both SL2Z and the other, and that comes down to saying that if you take this matrix Y, which is 28 by two, and you take Y by Y transpose, that's now just two by two, and what's more, it's symmetric, so suddenly you have only three coefficients to worry about. So now you have a function that depends on three parameters. I'm being terribly rough. And that would remind you if you're a number theorist of Ziegel multiple forms. And it had been found by various physicists there. I don't want to mention because I'll leave out names. Then in this case, the counting function that you need is actually a Ziegel multiple form. So it depends on three variables, a tau, a tau prime, and a z, and a z. But it's, the, it's a famous Ziegel multiple form of weight 10. I haven't defined any of this. One of the famous Ziegel uh, forms, that may be the most famous, it's the exact analog in one of the one variable function delta of tau that Igusa discovered, I don't know, 40 years ago, a very famous function, but it's in the denominator. And because it's in the denominator, it has zeros, and then when they're in the denominator, the new function is poles. But usual poles, you can go around them. But in higher dimensions, the pole gives you a wall, and you, you cross it. And, and, and also, if you do some contour integral to compute a Fourier coefficient, then when you cross this pole, well, you pick up a residue, and so things jump. So somehow, it's because this function is the reciprocal of a holomorphic multiple form, here a Ziegel form, that you get the wall crossing. And the final physical interpretation of the whole thing, again, I'm going to skip all, of, all details. So these three numbers, A, B, and C, are some quantum numbers of the states. If you imagine two, if you take the simpler one, one over delta of tau, that would correspond to much simpler multiple forms, which would just be a one by one matrix, whose coefficients would be the coefficients of one over delta. That one has been much studied, and that would correspond to some simple kind of black holes in some model. But if you had a diagonal matrix, A, zero, zero, C, well, that would correspond, let's say, to two of these simple things, but very far apart. So they're somehow in the theory too. But the ones we care about are somehow bigger. They are twice as big, but they only have a single center. So they're, they're sort of single-centered black holes. Don't ask me again too much to explain, but Atish is right there, and he's happy to answer all questions. So we put two little dots in a circle, meaning they're sitting there together. And these things move around. But they're parameterized by point in multi space. When that thing in multi space crosses a wall, these are called the walls of marginal stability. Then 
it can sort of degenerate. It can throw off little single standard black holes. Let's say it turns into a different one. And so it's kind of messed up. But among the single standard there are also single centered ones, which are twice as big, but they're, those are what they call wonderful terminology, immortal. Immortal black holes don't die because they're immortal. When they cross a wall, they simply cross the wall. But there are also these horrible ones which are kind of a coalescence of two single ones. And when they cross these walls, they can fall apart and split up. And so they mess up your counting. So the question for the physicists was really, can we take this whole counting theory that they had already computed, which were the coefficients of this, but which jump around, and then split off, split it up into two pieces, one of which doesn't jump and will count the immortal things which are immortal and so they have well-defined numbers. And then the other part is something explicit. I mean, the jumps were completely well known. We knew how much it jumped by. Just since there are jumps, it can't be a nice multiple form. So if you're going to count for the jumps, and it turned out it works on the nose, the original thing, this meromorphic Ziegel form, when you take its Fourier expansion in tau prime, gives you meromorphic Jacobi forms. When you take their Fourier coefficients, according to Sanders Vekas, you split it into two pieces, one of which is a mock multiple form, and the other is a completely explicit thing called an appellar sum. But you write it down. It's known. And so you split the whole thing into two pieces. This, each coefficient that you want to know, is one coefficient plus another. And the second coefficient has the jumps, and it's completely explicit. It's an elementary, a little complicated, but elementary sum. And the other doesn't jump. That's counting the immortal black holes. And so when we went through the whole theory, it took, as I said, four years to work out all of the wrinkles because you need a very interesting family of mock multiple forms. It turned out that this uh, immortal part was exactly a mock multiple form. And therefore, the abstract, as I read to you, we show that the generating function of the quantum degeneracies of single centers, immortal black holes in type 2, you know, n equals 4 super string theory, is a mock multiple form of way to half. Now, I'll just end, I've still six more minutes with a few, uh, well, I won't go beyond six, even though we started late because of the announcements. Let me just say a few words about a related development that I would have mentioned anyway, but somebody asked about it at the tea two days ago. It's been a little bit in the papers recently, and you may have even heard, so I would have probably wanted to mention a few words anyway. So, very, very briefly, Many years ago, uh, John McKay noticed. So John McKay was, is both a number theorist and a group theorist. And so like every number theorist, he knew the J function and knew, had seen and recognized this coefficient, which only number theorists kind of would have immediately spotted. But he also was a group theorist, and so he knew that, uh, I'll just put MO, the monster group, which is a group of order roughly 10 to the 70 or something like that, or 10 to the 59, I forgot, some huge monstrous number. This group has approximately 170 representations, so as many as it has comes class, it's of that order, less than 200, but it's a huge group. The order is 10 to the 60 or something. And the first one, of course, the dimension is one. That's true for every group of the smallest here to use, but that's the trivial representation. But the second one is 196.883. And so everybody in group theory, many people like Conway, many others knew that number by heart. Many number theorists knew this one by heart. And when Kay was in both camps, he recognized, he said, that can't be a coincidence. He showed it to lots of people, in particular Conway, and the whole theory blew up. And this was originally called moonshine, meaning just blah, 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 because nobody could prove anything. It was all guesswork and looked a little crazy. And since it was connected with the monster, it was called monstrous moonshine. And then in the course of the succeeding years, there were many refinements. I could tell the story, but not in this time, and it doesn't, I decided not to. It would have fit this series beautifully, but it's very old. This is from the late 70s, I think. I don't remember exactly. Then there were various developments. First, Atkin, Fung, and Smith did a sort of a numerical check showing that the predictions were at least compatible with modular behavior. And then uh, Frankel, Leposki, and Moermann con constructed some infinite dimensional module of some something which had the, sort of the right properties. And finally, Borchertz uh, completely wrote down the thing which showed in an intrinsic way why this connection, and it goes way, way further. This was just the beginning that started the story, why the whole story is true. And he got the Fields Medal for that. So I'll just put Borchertz as the sort of final solver of that. And that's a very, very famous chapter in, in the theory of, in, in mathematics of recent years, which involved multiple forms and groups very thoroughly. So then, 
four years ago, well, I guess five now because it's 2015, but in 2010, there was another absolutely beautiful discovery by three Japanese mathematicians, Eguchi, Ogori, and Tachikawa. And they found that if you take, so again, a very special, so the, mon the monster group is the biggest of the 26 sporadic groups. And it, I think it even contains all the others as subgroups. But there's another one, a few of those, I think six or seven of these sporadic groups were in the 19th century or, or very early 20th century. And the biggest one of those is called the Mathieu group. Uh, well, actually, there are three of them, 10, no, 11, 12, and 24. It's 23 and 24, maybe there are four of them. It was the biggest one. If you took this, then if you looked at its representations, you found some numbers which... I don't remember exactly. I think those were the first three. And they notice that these are equal. It was just an observation first. Complete mystery, more moonshine. Coefficients, again, of something modular. But it was a big surprise because here, this is a modular function. So it's an ordinary modular form, rational, but of, well, I mean, with not holomorphic, because it's weight, but of weight zero. But these things were the form a very specific one which had already been studied by various people, actually even I had, and everybody had studied this particular one. It again had weighed, just like all of Ramanujan's examples, it had weighed a half. It wasn't, I think it was one in his last notebook. Anyway, it was definitely an example, but the point was that this was neither weight zero, but had weighed a half, nor was it modular, but mock modular. And this one was even better. You weren't even off by one, and here the next dimension, you have to take a combination. The first, I think, three coefficients of this mock model form were all on the list of irreducible representations. So it was clearly not a coincidence. And so then we had a new word in mathematics, or rather in physics. To my great amazement, I, I met, mentioned in many lectures and to many friends, nobody in the pure math world heard of it. Everybody in physics knew. And I'd gone to several conferences where it was talked about, but they were always physics conferences by people like, you know, Gabadil, and, and the mathematicians somehow didn't make a splash at the beginning. Now it has. So this was called Mathieu Moonshine. It was this wonderful discovery. And then three mathematicians, maybe I'll skip their first names. So, I mean, I know them all personally. Miranda Cheng, John Duncan, and Jeff Harvey, uh, all mathematical physicists, but all very good mathematicians, uh, as indeed these three are too, uh, they discovered that actually there's a generalization of that Mathieu thing, namely, and I'll just say it very quickly, if you think about lattices, in particular even unimodular lattices, then it's very well known, and it's been known for a long time, and uses multiple forms to prove that it, the dimension, the rank of such a lattice must be multiple of eight. For eight, there's exactly one. For rank 16, there are exactly two, but well, okay, there are two. In rank 24, they're exactly 24. And in rank 32, they're at least 80 million. So these 24, of course, are very famous. They were completely classified by Niemeyer. One of them is the famous Leech lattice. The other 23 are not the famous Leech lattice. So these are called the Niemeyer lattices. And what they discovered was that there's a, a moonshine story attached to each one of these 24. And one of them, I've, or maybe of 23, I'm not sure exactly how it works. And each one was very similar to what the three Japanese whose names I apologize to them I just erased. And so this was called, because it was, everything was mock, and I had the shadow, and shadow in Latin, of course, is umbra, so they called this umbral moonshine. So now we had, and they formulated very, very precise conjectures for all 23 or 24 cases, which in the case, in one of the cases, the group was the mature group, and in the other case, they were smaller subgroups of M24. And in each case, but also in the usual monster case, there were many subgroups. There was a similar story. So they did this, and they've done a great deal of work since, two huge papers of, I don't know, 200 pages. And then, uh, as I understand it, but I'm not an expert, and I haven't seen any of the papers, a few months ago, Terry Gannon proved a big part of the umbral moonshine conjecture, but only the numerical part, the analog of what I mentioned here, that Atkin and, and his two students, Fong and Smith, did, which is to check the compatibility with all the multidarity, maybe a little more. So he did that for the original case of the three Japanese, so the Mathieu Moonshine. And then about a month ago, I think, uh, John Duncan, who was one of the three, I won't put initials anymore, one of the three authors of the conjecture, the same John Duncan, a graduate student, uh, 
and, uh, and his supervisor, Ono, who's a mathematician, who's an expert on mock modular forms, uh, they, well, they've announced in a big way to the press, I mean, Ono in particular, that they've solved the full moon, umbral moonshine conjecture, but as, as far as I can understand, they've done something in between. They've done the analog of what Afkin and Fong and Smith did in the old case, which is sort of this numerical part, and it, and it generalizes what Gannon did, so it includes that case, but he had done the, that case first, which is a, in some sense the, the central case. On the other hand, their proof is uniform and apparently very elegant. I haven't seen it yet. I'm sure it's a very good proof, but I don't know to what extent it's true that the full umbral moonshine conjectures are true or not true. But I want to at least have mentioned this conjecture, and I'll just say that since there are roughly 23 cases, you get roughly 23 very special mock modular forms all with more or less the same shadow, I mean, up to a constant. So they all differ, or linear combinations of them differ by ordinary model forms, but they're all different. And so you get a bunch of very specific forms of low level. And in the work with uh, Atish uh, Dabulkar and Samir Murti, we also had very specific model forms in several certain cases that we had in the last chapter of the book where things worked out very well in terms of this physics model. And then the two lists are almost identical, our list of special not multiple forms, and the one coming up in the umbral moonshine conjectures, which are now at least at that level theorems, uh, those two lists are almost the same. The divergencies were very mysterious two years ago, but Miranda, I think, has now completely understood them. So there is seriously a connection between this, these models in string theory and the models on the group theoretical and multiple forms side. So that's the story I wanted to tell you today. So thank you very much. Atish is sitting there giggling. He can hardly hold his, his sides for, for laughing at the way I described his work. But, uh, you know, it's, that's how it is, you know. <laughs> so you get by working with people who don't know what they're doing. But he's very forgiving and he's being nice about it. But as I said, if you want to know what it's actually about, don't read the paper for heaven's sake. Read the book later. It's going to be beautifully written. He and Samir are writing an introduction that will make all of quantum field theory all of string theory and all of the classical and string theory of black holes crystal clear to any mathematical reader. And I'm looking forward very much to that final version. But the current version in the archive, if you can read it, you're a better man than any of the authors. So, or woman, as the case may be. I don't think any of us can read the whole paper and actually know what each sentence says. But presumably at least one of us knows what each sentence says. So it's, it's not an easy read. But, but if you want to know the truth, just ask Atish. Above all, don't ask me. Any, any questions? Any further questions? <laughs> that was sort of my question, but come on, somebody. Students can ask afterwards, but if you've got a PhD, this is your only chance. Ah, the order. That's very nice. Well, there's a rough answer and a precise answer. The question is, what, after all the dust cleared, what was this order of a mock multiple form? When Ramanujan said three of order three, 10 of order five, and three of order seven. There were various partial answers. Vaker said it's more or less this. So more or less is easy. I told you that, for instance, for the ones of level five, he had 10, Ramanujan, I mean, but he himself gave identities showing that it was actually a five by two matrix. There were five groups of two, and each vector differed from a multiple of each other vector by usual multiple form. So there was essentially just one, but it was vector valued. And each of those forms separately, I told you that the whole vector transforms under all of SL2Z. But if you take the subgroup, which preserves up to a constant at least, each term, that roughly has level five. It roughly has gamma five. But actually, it's got a little bit more. So very, very roughly, the order is the level. Except that, as Svekers noticed, uh, five and seven were correctly named. Three was actually misnamed. Two of them have level three, but one is level two, and you've applied a Hecke operator. There's some technical thing. It's actually not quite level three, but roughly it's the level, which I've told you is just the subgroup. But I mentioned today the word Jacobi forms. I didn't talk about it. It's not that hard. I could have, but I didn't. I just mentioned that you go from a Ziegel modular form, like this one of Igusa, a Ziegel modular form is a function of three variables, tau z and tau prime put together as a symmetric two by two matrix. And then if you Fourier develop in tau prime, you get a function of two variables, one in H and one in C, and that's called the Jacobi form. 
And then if you Fourier develop it in, in Z, then you get a function just of tau, and those are multiple forms, except that if this is meromorphic instead of holomorphic, then that was Sanders' big discovery, you get a multiple form. So somehow we have a Jacobi form, and it turns out actually in the theory of, of the three altars I've been mentioning, we developed a theory of something called mock Jacobi forms, which are sort of their coefficients are mock multiple forms. And the mock Jacobi form, a Jacobi form doesn't have a level, or rather it does, but R is always level one. So they were on the full multiple group, except that because there are two variables, as well as the multiple group in tau, you have the translations of the elliptic curve in Z. And so you actually have the Jacobi group. So this is gamma, gamma J, the Jacobi group, which is an extension by Z2, but it's still got level one. So all of these things have level one, but a Jacobi form has two indices. One is called the weight, and the other is called the index. And it's not the subgroup. It's the other Morphy factor. There's a form as well as the C tau plus D to the K, there's a second function in the transformation law, which is e to the 2 pi i m times something, and that m is called the index. And so the actual answer turned out to be that the order, in all of the cases except one of the weight three cases, is one sixth of the index. So in other words, I told you we got these special families. Two of the, spe the most beautiful special families had index. They all had weight one half, but one of them had index 30, and the other had index 42. And that was these were on the nose, Ramanujan's chi 1 and chi 2, and the ones for 42, the coefficients were on the nose. It's a triple, it's a vector, his three functions of order 7. So it turned out the precise answer was completely unexpected. The order is a sixth of the index of the associated mock Jacobi form, something he could not have guessed. But anyway, thanks for the question. It's kind of a fun answer that, you know, there's a six. Of course, all of multiple forms have sixes and twelves and twenty fours everywhere. I think we all need a drink. <laughs>